Welcome everybody. I'm absolutely delighted to be part of this and um, when Richard first approached me to think about something that we might explore in the um, in a discussion, um, my mind immediately went to these letters. Um, I'd come across Rilke uh, in a roundabout way, uh, partly through um, Jeff Dyer's book on Tarkovsky's uh, um, Stalker movie. Um, and in it, he quotes a, a wonderful passage from uh, one of the Duino el elegies. Um, but we're living in a time, as Richard said, uh, we, it's a time to reassess what we're doing, um, uh, make in, particularly in making music, uh, as we're, we're here, um, how we do it and why we do it. Um, and I think Rilke gives us some very good pointers um, towards ways in which we might sort of reassess our, our, um, our working practice as musicians. Um, and I think it's quite a good place to start in some ways is his ideas on humility and simplicity, um, partly because, you know, that speaks very much to this um, uh, period of, of isolation and, and solitude and that we go into ourselves, which is something that he can, he constantly sort of uh, exhorts us to do. Um, but to find this, the really simple, humble uh, ways in which to do that. Um, I've got various sort of pages marked in my copy here. Um, and one that sort of comes sort of straight away is, uh, he says, for this reason, flee general subjects and take refuge in those offered by your own day-to-day -day life. Depict your sadnesses and desires, passing thoughts and faith in some kind of beauty. Depict all this with intense, quiet, humble sincerity and make use of whatever you find about you to express yourself, the images from your dreams, and the things in your memory. Um, he, he really does ask uh, us all to sort of go into ourselves, to look into ourselves, to, to be present in the here and now. And I think um, one of his other great words is attention, um, is this business of really noticing what is there, whether that's in a piece of music, whether it's in the world around us, um, he's very very good on nature and our relationship to nature and being um uh being attentive to, to to what is going on and i find that inspiring as a musician that that we should um really really look it's this business of 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 uh it's um I've often said about the difference between listening to something and just hearing something. If you say I, I heard Beethoven's fifth um, on the radio, it's very different to I listened to Beethoven's fifth on the radio. And this, this, this attention, um, I think, is one of his uh, um, most inspiring ideas. So I'm going to sort of hand over and I'll sort of dot in here and there but um, I just wonder whether whether the, these these themes of humility and simplicity and solitude um, struck uh, other people on the panel. I was very struck actually by the fact that Rilke is very realistic about what I think of as his hymn to solitude in these pages there's very little technical advice on writing poetry. In, in, you know, in many ways, I can only say thank God to that. But what I find very heartening is that his recommendation of, of solitude and severe internal self-scrutiny, as, well as, self as well as the scrutiny of natural things in the world, as Mark was saying, um, at no point does Rilke fail to keep reminding us that enduring solitude is bloody hard work. And in letter seven, at least in my translation, he says, and you should not let yourself be confused in your solitude by the fact that there is something in you 
that wants to break out of it, that wants to break out of it. And then he says, this very wish will help you if you use it quietly and deliberately and like a tool to spread out your solitude over white country. And he continues, you must hold to what's difficult. It's good to be solitary for solitude is difficult. That something is difficult must be all the more reason for us to do it. So there's no sentimental uh, roseate colouring of solitude and no downplaying of the exhaustion that it can induce. As, as I understand it, the, this, this urge for solitude, it really comes from um, what Mark was saying about the requisite for attention. Um, and we need to pay attention, he says, much, much more to what passes within us, um, our inner life, um, both our joys, but also our pains and sorrows as well. He makes that point to the uh, aspiring poet. I think he must have said it in, in one of his replies, you know, I, I'm having trouble in my life and I, I felt sad and pained and so on. And Rilke turns around and says, well, yeah, but, you know, think about that. That went right through you, didn't that? That went to the core of you. And um, that's what Rilke wants us to pay attention to. Um, and I think that's all to do with trying to escape the kind of conventions and, if you like, cliches of, um, of society. That's why we need to be solitary. That's why we need to sort of go into ourselves to avoid the pernicious kind of influence of um, other people. Certainly, he says how, um, in, in my translation, it was how, how, how chattering everybody is and, and what a noise they make and you must uh, separate yourself from all of that and, and go into yourself and it's to do with looking into yourself um, and, and so on. I think that that idea of the chattering society distracting us from our true purpose is, is perhaps with social media and so on um, even more uh, relevant today. I think uh, one thing I love about it is this idea of waiting and being patient mm. and not always feeling that you have to be producing, but just, just having faith that something is happening if, if it's coming from the right place so that um, you're not thinking of, of all the wonderful work that's been produced in the past and that, that you have to write love poetry or you have, and he says, don't do that. Don't do the things that have been done brilliantly. Do the things that are personal to you. And I think that's also part of getting rid of, of that, that um, voice, which, which we all have from time to time, of, of, um, is this any good? Which is so destructive. And he says that in the very first letter, he says, you ask, you ask if your poems are any good. And he, he just refuses to acknowledge that as a, as a relevant question. <laughs> um, Can I just throw in on, on, yeah. the patient, on the patience thing that it's actually brought up in by Lewis Hyde in the introduction to the, the Penguin edition. Um, and he says about Rodin, uh, who was um, one of his big heroes, or at least for a while. And he says, um, there is in Rodin a deep patience, which makes him almost anonymous, a quiet, wise forbearance, something of the great patience and kindness of nature herself. And I, and I love that idea of, of uh, in him look, looking at Rodin, whether, whether this was hero worship or, or not, but it, what he actually takes from Rodin was this ability to, to, to really take time to, um, to, to look and to, um, and, and to make and to work. Um, that's one of his other great themes of, of working at something. I think patience is also connected with a sense of not knowing what's going to happen, what's going to happen next mm. in one's own work. And, mm. and also with the idea of 
um, solitude, I mean, it's very tempting to think because we're all in a lockdown solitude that we take, might take the idea of solitude literally, but actually I think he means solitude in a much more figurative sense in that one's own experience of oneself has to be the source of one's work and one is always, I think he says, incomprehension is after all, is, is after all being alone. So one, one is always in a sense of, um, in, a, in a, one is always alone in relation to the social known and the chattering and the judgments that might impinge on one about whether one's work is good or bad. Do you send your work to magazines and are they accepted? And if they're not, then you're very dejected about it and so forth. But um, what's more important for him is this yes, because he also talks, of going into oneself. He talks about solitude in relation to even intimate relationships that, that you have to maintain your solitude and, and that this is the pitfall. Yeah. I mean, he's terribly young himself, isn't he? But he says this yes. is what the young do. They throw themselves into, into um, passionate relationships which seem, which seem like the most important thing and they lose their, mm. they lose their solitude very young mm. and that we continue to do that. The thing he says about comprehension, I think he links, he says com in, in comprehension is, is the, um, is, is the response of a child and he, he values that. And yes, he values yes. incomprehension because he, I think he, I forget which letter it is, but he, he contrasts that with um, the feeling of contempt. Um, which yes. Which to my mind right. links to his, his really, for, for, for poets and writers, really striking uh, observation that we must avoid irony. Um, may I chip in for a moment on mm. on irony <laughs> this is one point this was the one point in in the whole of this selection of letters where um, I, I felt um, I felt strong strong doubts about that because I had in mind um, Schlegel's remarks on irony from the 1790s, which are brilliant because Schlegel in his romantic novel Lucinda insists that in the very darkest and most painful of places, that is where irony has its most truthful home, which, which I believe to be profoundly the case, actually. Um, and it was curious because just to return to what we've been talking about, um, in letter four, there's a great deal of insistence on the virtue of learning in your work to tolerate uncertainty. And what Rilke actually writes is, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are written in a very foreign town. And he says, live the questions now, which really is a terrific exhortation. Live the questions now. But, I mean, one of the things that worries me is that in, in our training and in our institutions, we tend to focus on exactly the opposite. We, train, <laughs> we tend to require certainty uh, and we test um, sort of confidence and answers rather than uh, hoping for and encouraging a questioning mind. And the other thing from what, what everyone's just been saying that worries me so much is that we've created a, a world around us which always feels short of time. And, and um, certainly for musicians, uh, you know, that life is always a scurrying uh, lifestyle. And how, if you're short of time, how can you? How can you be attentive if you you know if you're just working on pieces of music that you've had a limited amount of time to be with? How can you be really attentive to them? Uh, because you're basically needing to you know be following the notes still. You haven't had enough time to really commune. And what Martha was saying about uh, not knowing, well, we 
we emphasize in training a, a kind of showing of knowing mm. and, uh, and so that's uh, that, that's upset what we're trying to do on stage I think you know we, 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 we like Mark was talking about humility is right at the center of all of this and and but we, we muddle it up with a kind of ego and confidence on stage and it almost ends up being exactly the opposite of what we want from our art um, in, our, in our community, in our lives. So these, these things worry me such a lot. Mm. Mm. He was very well, keen on, on the signpost, on, on, on the pointing towards. Um, and I think, you know, he also says that, you know, for a poet, essentially, you know, at, at the end of your life, you might be able to write 10 lines that are any good. Um, and it's all sort of a leading towards. And I think with, with learning music, um, I often feel that, you know, with a piece like the Matthew Passion, which I've you know, done many, many times, or Winterizer, I'm, I'm always in a sort of process of becoming or, or, or of, 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 of gaining more, more insight to, into something. And, and I never feel that a sort of a finished product is going to be arrived at. Um, that it's it's simply a sort of process that will continue uh, time and time again. And um, it would be quite interesting to, to ask Sini or Amarins, you know, if, if they feel they're encouraged to do that, you know, you know, your the, the early parts of your careers. And um, do, do you feel the sort of pressure to, to sort of come up with performances that somehow live up to or even exceed you know what's gone before or are you are you are you sort of able to be patient and and um enjoy this the the, the that the, that long-term process i guess it really comes back to um uh, you know being comfortable in well not comfortable being being okay with living the question as he says because uh I mean, I think the reason why the letters are so powerful is that they really, they talk about sort of cultivating an inner life in a most sort of most universal and most specific sense. Um, and I, I mean, of course, um, of course, there's a huge amount of, of, of pressure uh, to, to, to deliver something. Uh, every time you have a debut some, somewhere, it's uh, yeah. It's a very strange time of your life. Um, so I I think. Um, but on another way, I think also the way Wilke writes, it's it's uh, incredibly. Um, it's like he's writing in a very uh, to to an ideal, towards an ideal, and and you know he he uses so many superlatives and sort of everything is sort of almost unutterable and it's like the, the infinite tenderness and sort of everything is reaching towards the unreachable but you know that the trying of it is, is what's worthwhile worthwhile as a human so I, I i don't know i think you have to um i mean i i, I don't think R rilke himself i think he, he struggled greatly and and uh, also what i read about his circumstances in, in life. I mean, he um, he writes of of, of this love, um, yet he had had a child, and and they, they they were not able to, you know, stay together or or, or raise the raise the child themselves. I mean, I, I think it's almost yeah. It, I'm not sure how I'm relating to your question, except that I I, I think it's about. Um, Living the question and being being okay with with um, with feeling the judgment, yet having patience and, and 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 trying to come from a place of cultivating cultivating the inner. Anyway, that's what I thought. Mm. Yeah. Well, the demand, the demands is an extraordinary level of devotion to whatever art it is that you are you are pursuing and and that is what makes these letters so inspiring because we all like to be urged towards um, greater things sometimes it worries me it's interesting that that Kappas at the end of course he he says he's not going to pursue his career as a poet in the end 
Um, and Rilke doesn't make a judgment on that, but uh, you know, he wasn't inspired in, in that direction. And the other thing that worries me about the letters is, is, is this solitude thing. And I, I, I think I, I fully understand why we need to be um, solitary in our, in our habits and our thoughts and so on. Um, we mustn't, whether it's a poem or a, a performance, we mustn't accept kind of hand-me-down versions from, from other people. That's partly why I think he says, to campus, don't don't write love poems, and they are too fraught with with what everybody else has said before you. you. You have to look into yourself, or you have to look out towards nature to find something original and and, and true to you, really. But he he does seem to, or in these letters at least, he he neglects any idea that I would I would be recommending in a poetry workshop, for example, go and read other people, go and listen to what other people have to say i think we we should be reading critics and, and so on and he's he seems in these letters to be quite clear that is not what he wants his young aspiring poets to be doing he re he recommended uh, two things in one of the early letters one was yes. the Bible and the other was a, a, a writer that i didn't know about a, i think a, Nor a norwegian writer yeah, yeah. He's uh, which is actually a, a, a book well worth reading, um, which I did get hold of. Um, but he, what he does say about that is you've got to read it with love. Um, and I think one of the, th that was a, something also that I took away from the letters that is that um, cr one of the reasons he rejects criticism is he often feels it's, it is sort of judgmental and trying to sort of come up with some sort of last word on something. And, and, what he's rather encouraging to do, um, particularly in the in, in the Jens uh, Peter Jakobsen uh, book, is to 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 fall in love with literature, to fall in love, and that's the same with with music. Is it, is it, you can't, and possibly that touches on the irony question as well. Is to sort of detachment is not something that he really um, likes. He thinks that 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 that, that sort of uh, objective. Uh, relationship to to other works um, is you know can limit you and I think that what what um, in his encouragement to read it seems to be that 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 you've got to you've got to really sort of go that go there go you know go an extra mile to to to, to love the piece and I, I think that's very true with with learning music um, there's there's sort of no point in in continuing it's with something if it's sort of anti antithetical. But isn't he also following along the sort of the route that Denise was suggesting about that, that Rilke is actually addressing himself in the, in the, in the letters in it, but it seems to me in an incredibly uh, protective way, he's wanting to protect some aspect of himself from something that might impinge on it destructively. And I think that's why he's not actually giving any um, kind of workshop criticism or any suggestions or, or any particular kind of um, pointers to how something might be improved or might be made better. Um, and, and 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 what he want I think what he wants to protect in himself is um, <laughs> it's very difficult to characterize I think but to me it's some, it's it's something to do with the relationship between I mean love what you say about falling in love with a piece of music must have something to do with this but it 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 it, it I I think it's to do with wanting protect a particular relationship that some absolute core in himself has with the medium that he's working with. We don't often think of poetry as a medium in the same way that we might think of painting as a medium or maybe music is because of its abstraction is a, is a, is a medium but I think it's interesting, isn't it, though? Presumably what we're all 
what we're all doing is about wanting to share something which it does come from within ourselves but we want to share it and in that case do we not need the the recipients of, of what we do to to share with us their responses to it and i think it's a very difficult question you know because um if if you're a performer for instance um and and you want to you want to communicate a piece of music to an audience surely part of that is feeling that the audience has received it and and therefore therefore we need we need some kind of response but isn't that sharing always mediated through something which um may be resistant to an immediate transmission of feeling or or something tra totally transparent because there's always a something that you have to an experience that you have to go through as the somebody listening to music or somebody reading a poem which is not the same as a direct a kind of directness of communication like speaking directly to somebody yeah as you would in real life i i find i i i have the same the same reaction as you martha i think that mm. um I mean, it seems very important when you're writing, mm. um, perhaps as an, 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 an analogy in when you're composing, precisely not to think of the reader, not mm. to imagine a reader, mm. not to hear or be aware, or at that point, give a damn about the possibility of having a reader and not to care about how you might be heard, how you might be received, or if you ever will in this world be received, at that point of composition, it really, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. And um, isn't that what's inspiring about the letters? I think, yes. To me. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yes. But at the same time, if you are creating something which you want to, to put over, then there are ways of, of putting it on the page which are going to make it more um uh easier to 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 ingest at the other end so for instance sonata form you know we the we 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 repeat our themes at per, uh, at particular times because that's when the audience has learned that, that they're going to hear them and repetition for instance repetition endlessly in music is so important if you don't repeat what you're doing in music then then people don't get it they only get one shot Mm -hmm. And um, maybe it's different in, in mm -hmm. writing, I don't know, but certainly if you were writing a play and you didn't make it clear who the characters were, if it was, you know, and, and the audience would, would not understand who that person was or whatever. So the, there are certain aspects of technique which one needs in order to put across one's innermost feelings and ideas and 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 yes I absolutely agree that you have to get rid of that that voice that that's saying is this any good and 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 thinking about how it's going to be received and whether it, whether people are going to think it's this or think it's that but at, at the same time there's there's a large amount of technique that's that's needed in order to put your ideas across can I can I throw another word in which is generosity because I, I think that um in a way what performers need to to offer to an audience and it is a very direct relationship actually um uh, unlike probably writing where we uh, and, and it's it comes into stark contrast at the moment when we don't really have a, a direct relationship with, the, with an audience but i do i do feel that um it, it, often performance is rather sort of limited by the fact that the, the performer well, I, I can see performers who are looking for admiration they're looking for the sort of the res the response from from the audience you know that it, singers are probably the worst at it it's 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 you know it's about the the singer and not the song um but i think if we can and, and i think what rilke sort of really tries to ask of us is is a sort of is a generosity i mean i think he he was enormously generous in his writing you know in, in the fact that he wrote eleven thousand letters um but it but it feels to me that that it's a 
it's a real sort of exchange and, and that's what's so, so nice about Lewis Hyde writing the introduction to the Penguin edition because his great book The Gift is all about the way that these things go around and, and, and we by, by launching something with generosity you may get something that comes back to you with generosity as well. Um, I don't know, I, I, we should probably bring in Amarin I, I, if you've got any thoughts on, on any of that. No, I'm, I'm finding, finding it really interesting. I think looking at what we were talking about earlier with the, the performance in mind and, and also I wanted to ask Sally actually about what it is like for her in a way, it, being a composer, if you're, if you're thinking while you're composing about the audience or more about what you have to say. I think that's a very interesting question about the, the writer and the poet um, versus someone on stage um, and maybe preparing in your own room and uh, whether that's really for the audience or whether some of that is also for yourself. I'm, I'm starting to think about that, but um, I don't know. Sally, do you have any more thoughts on, on that? Well, I have to say that this whole lockdown thing has has been a huge sort of learning experience for me because um i unlike most writers poets and novelists I, I, composers tend to work to commission so i'm always working towards a deadline and some of those deadlines have just been taken away and i realized that over the last 30 years or whatever i've become more and more reliant on 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 that on that deadline you know that oh, well you you have to do it there's no time to think you just have to do it no point in wondering what everyone's thinking or you know how it's going to go down or any and and in a way that 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 was a, a good result because i was i just didn't have time to to think about you know wh whether it was any good or not coming back to that um but actually i've realized that i'm that i'm not very good at just sitting and waiting and I've now got time. And I think a lot of people have, have been saying, well, I thought I'd have all this time, but I'm not getting anything done. Mm -hmm. But maybe I think I am getting something not done, but achieved within myself because actually it's sort of consolidated by reading these letters that, that actually what the, the work is happening within myself and, and in the way that one processes the world and, and, and one's emotions. And, and how one is a kind of crucible for that. Yeah. And isn't and that part of the, I mean, people talk, part of the paradox of communicating with or, or feeling that your music is conveying something to the person who's listening to it. But I mean, it seems to me that in my experience anyway, the most powerfully evocative musicians are, the, are, are ones who kind of paradoxically go deepest into themselves and that is actually it's that act of doing that which conveys yeah. more to someone else than if you're thinking about how I'm going to get something across to someone yeah, um, I, think, yeah. I mean that's my musical experience anyway We've had a couple of interesting uh, comments and questions from the audience. I think worth just bringing in here. Uh, one from Maggie Faultless saying, might music itself and the humility of performers be able to provide the mediation required to communicate at the deep level we are seeking to achieve? And another from Jenna Sherry that says, it seems to me that what is being discussed here is keeping one's artistic development and relationship with your art sacred so that it is not disturbed by the opinions and demands of the outside world or industry or career. Thoughts on that? Can, can I just uh, jump in with music, which is, I think one of the slightly confusing things is, is you know, who we are representing. There's very much a, a three-way conversation that goes on in, in making music between the composer, the performer and the audience. And uh, Benjamin Britten writes about that. I mean, it goes it, that goes all the way back to um, Roman um, philosophers as well, you know. But 
it, essentially, if I go to a Matthew Passion, or if I'm part, taking part in a Matthew Passion, I'm in the end sort of more interested in what Bach has to say than what Mark Padmore has to say, or, or, um, it, or any performer. It's 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 got to be a sort of, or at least you've got to keep in balance the various elements of that. And it is, a, I think that's a different relationship between, you know, purely being a writer and, and reaching uh, an audience. You, you're, you've, got a, you've got this intermediary. And I think for, for, for us musicians, um, we do need to bear that in mind because certainly in the sort of celebrity kind of culture of, of performance, it too often becomes about the performer and not, not, not what is being performed. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, though, that as a composer, this incredible alchemy that happens between the composer, the performer, and then the audience is, is just one of the most fantastic things. And, and that, that a, a, a performer always brings something to, to what I've written that I'm not expecting and, and something which, which I couldn't have, have imagined. So there, there's an element of, of, of creation that happens in that process. And, and so, so therefore I, th I think the performer is, is a creator and, 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 and must feel that they are a creator and, and not a servant. So that, so that they, they do bring something of what's within them, uh, you know, just as much as the composer, the, the, the performer has that, that, that similar crucible going on of all the experiences that they've had, which then feed into what they bring to the music. Mm. As, as a highly reluctant sometime performing writer, um, I'm always struck and rather consoled by the fact that an audience listening to a reading has no idea about the huge degree of power that it as a listening audience will enact on the way that I as a performing speaker can speak my own or sometimes somebody else's work. There's a quality of I mean, with luck, there's a quality of sympathetic and intense listening that you can feel when you're on stage in your audience, which is, it's completely incalculable. You don't know whether it would be there in advance. You don't know whether uh, you might be, you know, bore, boring your poor audience to tears and be, faced with, with a wall of stone or you're reading in a bookshop where the acoustics of a room lined with books seem to absorb and deaden the human reading voice in a way that is fatal to any reading. But the, the felicitous side is uh, the, the moment when you, when you realize that the quality of listening in the room permits you to, mm, to allow your own voice to become anonymous in the best way, if you understand what I mean by that. And, and so you as the performer, you were then released from the horrible burden of being, you know, this human of this age kind and, you know, wearing this, this blue shirt or whatever it is. And at that point, only because of the, that, that wonderful listening quality of an attentive audience can, in a sense, everybody be freed from the accidents of the person and into the pure sound. Is it, when, is it that your voice is becoming... I mean, this is just an analogy, but is it, is, it, is it that your voice is becoming like an instrument in that sense, that it's not, not a person, but it's... I think it's so much... made true. into something um, that can go beyond the, you as a person. It has its own... It's not just your voice, of course. It's a voice, you reading the poem. That's the thing. Mm. Which transforms it into... into something which is separate 
from you as an individual person? That's always the hope. <laughs> yes. That idea of humility, it, it does go back. I think one of the mistaken things perhaps about the letters is, is the, the, the focus that Rilke has on being solitary and solitude and so on. And, and sometimes that makes it sound as if he's recommending some sort of egotistical obsession. Um, and I think probably he's suggesting the opposite of that, that we um, need to, to, to pay attention to what is happening within and, and without. And um, when I was reading the letters again, it, it, it uh, has been said before, I'm sure, so it reminded me of, of John Keats's letters uh, back in 1819 about negative capability and so on, where he uh, again urges us to, to focus on um, our inner life and talks of the world as a kind of veil of soul making. And it's all to do, as with Rilke, Rilke talks about um, ripening our our self in, in, in some way. And Keats says very much the same thing. But what Keats also links that to, um, Rilke then talks very much about sol being solitary and, and, and so on. Keats talks about walking into a room and feeling himself extinguished in some way as if he does has no self at all and I think the two are incredibly close to each other but they have very different emphases how that relates to music I'm not too sure music seems to me so much more um, to do with or involved in um, relationships between people um, the writer is 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 by nature a very very solitary beast I think um, but, but music needs the cooperation of others more often than not and I think has more often than not a much more direct relationship with the audience. I think one thing I was feeling just as, as Denise was talking about the, the quality of the audience and our, our feeling uh, about the audience when we're on, on the stage, um, it almost feels like there are two uh, ways that one can respond if it feels like the audience isn't in a zone where we, we've, we're with them. And the, the more um, common one is to energize more and, and put more extrovert gesture and, or speak louder. Um, and I, I think probably it's exactly the opposite, which is our most effective is to, is to go deeper inside to the quality and genuineness of what we're trying to find and that ultimately that will be our way of communicating with our audience much more powerfully than anything that's more extrovert. Mm. And that, I mean, that touches on something you were talking about, Sally, as well. How, to, what extent, how, how, to what extent do we need to uh, include a sense of extra gesture as opposed to it being something which we've found so much in ourselves that we no longer need to be aware of doing any any gesture that's uh, that's conscious and that may, maybe that can be an even more powerful way of, of communicating. Is, isn't there also, uh, sorry, no. uh, I'm, I'm sort of thinking back to how I feel or, or what occurs inside me when I read uh, Rilke's words um, and what happens inside me when I try to come closer to a composer's language when I try try to um, you know in in a, in 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 a way both of both processes of, of of reading music and reading reading letters on a page um, are about coming closer to to sort of patterns of 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 a soul really or uh, and. Um, I don't know, I think reading itself can be a creative process, just like learning music can be a creative process because it's um, the embodiment of someone's soul in, in mine, or that's, I, I guess, the attempt to, to, to be a medium. And I mean, that's what I loved about reading the, the these letters by Rilke, is that it, it reminded me of of being you know, in the in the process, in the movement of of, of music, of of of. Um, uh, it, it's hard to put into words. 
Uh, I think but, what, but, what he might lead us towards as well, and it's a, it's a, a two words that I think that haven't just come up uh, so, so far. I know we're getting to the end, but I, I'd love to, to throw them in before we leave. Uh, one word is wonder. Um, <clears throat> Goethe, one of my favorite phrases of Goethe is zum Erstaunen bin ich da. <clears throat> I'm here to experience wonder. Um, um, and the other one is praise. And, mm -hmm. and actually it's not something that necessarily you find uh, immediately in the, in the letters uh, to the young poet, but it is something I think that Rilke certainly builds towards. Um, uh, and it's, it, 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 it um, taps into this sort of spirit of generosity. At the e very end of the, um, the, the, the Penguin edition, he also um, is included the letter to, from the young worker, which was an actual fictional um, letter that he wrote uh, towards the end of his life. And the, the pretty much the last line is, give us teachers who praise the here and now. Um, he loved the here and now, um, but I, I think this 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 sort of um, generous response to life um, uh, in, in in a way of of, of, of praising of, of uh, it's it's not not just sort of praising something to God, his relationship to God or to 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 anything outside of um, this world, the here and now, <clears throat> is is quite complicated. I think. But, but I love the idea that, that we are here to praise. I, I was very moved by um, when Rilke did use the word God, and I, I don't remember which letter, but, um, and he talked about it as something which um, you're not born with it, you don't necessarily have it in your childhood, you may not have it in your adulthood, but it's some sort of notion of something which might be something you can move towards and have some sense of. And I thought that was, that was uh, very, very touching. Many of the poems do talk much, much more explicitly about this idea of praise, which, which I agree with Mark, is, is very close to Goethe's sense of wonder and, and so on. And it is, and you've been talking about generosity and so on, what Rilke wants from Kappus and from all of us is, is a kind of openness to experience, whether it's inner experience or, or nature, and, and that's what the, the poems talk about. He, I remember he, I think it was in a letter, he talked about um, a visit to Toledo, I think it was, and he, he was just standing there on his own, of course, and he was watching a, a falling star, and he says, I felt the falling star fell through me. And it, again, it goes back to that comment in, in the letters to his uh, young friend about taking experience into ourselves in that way. So we feel it truly and fully. Uh, and I think anything that distances ourselves from that kind of experience, again, going back towards irony and, and so on, is, uh, is to be avoided for, for real play anyway. Mm. Well, t I think time pressure is certainly one of, and coming back to that again, is one of the things that uh, causes us so many problems. We, we take the easy way out, I think, with time. And um, Rilke, that's why Rilke wants us to, to have patience. Mm. He, had much, he had a great deal of patience, of course. I mean, these were written in the early 1900s. He uh, published the new poems. Um, soon after that, but he had to wait another 10 years or so before the Duino elegies were completed. And almost at the same moment, he also completed the sonnets to Orpheus sequence as well. Um, so his patience paid off, you would say. Um, and we all remember that, and it, it, it's a kind of legendary moment. Um, whether that is true for all the rest of us is another matter altogether, but he he's a great model to follow. I think it, the, the idea, this idea of waiting and patience is, it, it is connected to the idea of being a conduit of some sort that, that, mm. that um, ideas come to you. And I, I, I'm sure that performers must feel like that, that they, they are a conduit for the music, but that in the process, it's not just being a pipeline you you in the process are, are transforming the music as as you perform it 
and uh, it's interesting actually that that uh, folk musicians tend to say that they they find their tunes from the air that they they pull them down so that they were there all the time but they 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 gather them in um whereas um classical musicians tend to feel that they that that is coming from from something within and that they're putting it out onto the page or in, into the into the player's hands of course a folk musician would would be performing everything themselves that they that they had plucked from the air i don't know if if you performers feel feel that you are conduits or whether you are primary creators of the music that that you are communicating I think that the, um, there's a message from Graham Waterhouse saying the greatest music, for instance, in Matthew Fashion, may call for form of selflessness in letting it speak alone, where music of less experience and historical gravity may depend more upon the initiatives and liveliness of ind individuality of the performer. I mean, it is, it is interesting. I think performers need to to have something to say, something of their own to bring to the to the table. Um, and you know, that's again where generosity comes in. It's the rehearsal process also is something that is something um, sort of remarkable for music. And, and again, um, some, an area which you don't really have as writers um, to actually be in a quartet or, um, uh, you know, working myself with a pianist uh, on Winterizer or something, you, it, there is a discussion and a sort of a, a fluidity about that which I think is uh, is is quite extraordinary. And again, if it can be inspired by a, a, a sense of, of generosity and of, of, of wanting to share, um, then it becomes all the greater. Uh, um, the, the, the the trying to, to just absorb admiration, um, I think, is is where it gets very difficult. Um, just to sort of be good yourself, you know. And I think music is, is problematic in that area in that we're often trained from an early age to look for, for that kind of approbation, that, that admiration, that, that the teacher who says, well done. Um, and it, it can interrupt the flow of, uh, of, of really sort of putting across something um, you know, that, that, that you want us to hand over. Richard, have we, are we time limited? Because I think everybody's feeling we are over our allotted. No, I think we, we should have another five minutes. We've we got another, sorry. Yes, we, yeah. But um, there's, there's, a, there's a question here from, from the audience, which uh, can I ask all of the poets and musicians what their advice would be to friends and young colleagues in this moment we find ourselves. Many of us have been soul searching and checking in, checking in with our deepest values and dreams. Could you speak from your own experiences with moments of change and uncertainty? Well, I, 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 I'll offer Martin's uh, um, uh, talking about Keats and negative capability and the, 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 what he says about ne negative capability is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. And th th something about the quietness, uh, I said I think in, in one of, I uh, also quoted T.S. Eliot, um, uh, teach us um, Sorry, I'll just get that. Uh, teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still, he says in Ash Wednesday. And it's this sitting still, which I think is one of the, the, the things we can draw on um, from this time and not necessarily try and with frantic activity to overcome something that is sort of beyond us at the moment. I think a little bit of quietness again, which is something that Rilke is, is encouraging us towards, I think is, is enormously um, powerful and, and helpful in this time. Mm. Yeah, I, I must say I agree with that very much. I think, weirdly, uh, 
feel like every morning I would wake up with this sense of calm, but at the same time, a complete sense of disquiet, if that makes any sense. So this, this calmness in my head of not immediately having to do something, which somehow I, I told my mom at some point, you know, it, it feels so strange not having a deadline. And she said, yeah, you know, you haven't not felt that since you were probably five years old. And I think that's definitely something I've struggled with is, is this feeling of no deadline. And, um, but also, which is nice in a way that you, you feel, okay, now I have time to go back into myself, which I think we've also been talking about tonight is this, you know, inner reflection and, and seeing, what it is exactly that's important to me. And, and weirdly, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll want a break from my violin immediately. And after a couple of days, I, I went back just because it felt comforting in a way. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a very frustrating time, but also definitely one to um, learn more about yourself and, and maybe find a sense of peace in what we're doing in a way and that it is the right decision and that actually it is right for us as people <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I, agree with that, I don't know if we've um, done justice it to, in the letters to, to how how um, vehemently uh, Rilke says what he's recommending um, as a, a, a process is going to be really hard and really frightening. Um, he, he uses an image of, of somebody being taken out of a small room and thrust onto a, a mountain top and, and, and that kind of bewildering sense or hurled into outer space or something of that kind. And maybe we felt some of that. I think we've been locked down, but actually what, what has happened is we all the kind of support mechanisms and, and for me, the usual kind of institutional props and scaffolding everything's been taken away. Personally, I I think I found it rather difficult and I've not found the period to be very creative or at least not yet. Um, maybe I shall take uh, Rilke's advice and remain patient and hope that something um, will come out of it. But it, it's certainly a very disturbing time because, because things have been removed that we, we tend to depend on 